woulda, coulda, shoulda. Cleveland baseball history is littered with all kinds of what ifs from injuries to big name players to close calls in the playoffs. If they just would have had that one more guy or guys who would have been hall on the hall of fame track, all of that explored today on today's what if Wednesday of lockdown guardians. You are locked on guardian, your daily podcast on the Cleveland guardian. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show today. Uh, we're going to talk about some guys that were snake bitten, but this is not a snake bitten podcast. And I also want to start by saying you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel. New customers can place a $5 bet, and you'll get started with $150 in bonus bets. If your first $5 bet wins, visit FanDuel.com to get started today. Yeah, lots of avenues to explore in this one. So if you love misery, uh, this will be the you episode. Got company. You. A, yeah, you got a lot of company. Uh, last week we did the what if uh, Cleveland had traded for Pedro Martinez. We talked about uh, <laughs> draft busts on Tuesday. If you haven't listened to Tuesday's show, we did the top 10 draft busts for Cleveland baseball since 2000. Had a lot of fun with that one. Uh, please go back and listen if you haven't already. We also did a bonus episode talking about the implications of David Fry's Tommy John surgery and what that means for Cleveland's offseason and how they'll approach the Josh Naylor situation. So if you're looking for any news on that, we've got you covered. Go back and listen to both of Tuesday's episodes. But today, it is What If Wednesday, and we're talking about the biggest injuries in Cleveland history. We're talking prospects. We're talking uh, most impactful injuries when they occurred. We're talking historical ones. And we're talking about guys who were on potentially a Hall of Fame but first, we should start with uh, everyone's favorite part of the show. I'm Justin Latta, co-host here of Lockdown Guardians. I've been here for two years now, and I have covered prospects for the Guardians minor league system since 2007 from my days at Guardians Baseball Insider, where I was the editor-in-chief for a while, also at the News Herald Morning Journal right now, next year in Cleveland on Substack, and a little bit of prospects live doing other prospect stuff. Yes, and I'm Jeff Ellis, uh, one of the first people they brought in to talk about baseball here in Lockdown. Before that, I was at a national podium talking about prospects in the draft at Scout and 24-7. All right, what if Wentz? Let's start with the prospects, Jeff, since that's our forte. We'll start with mm -hmm. prospects. Who who are the biggest prospects? Who is the biggest what-if prospect for you who had never gotten hurt? Who was on a track that you were most excited about um, prospect-wise? I mean, there's a lot of avenues to go for that one. Who, who would have... Who do you would have had the best career had they stayed healthy? Or you know, I've got, impactful? I've got like two different ways to look at that. Um, one is like potential impact on a team. Uh, it, to me, that would have been like, so it looking at that 2007 year, like if Michael Aubrey doesn't get hurt, I think he is in the lineup for them by 2007 because 2005, he starts the year in double a misses most of the year, 2006. Like he would have been, a better option than what they had at the you know DH at the time. Well, they had Hafner, but he could have played first base and would have been better than what they had at the time at first base. I remember doing a whole thing on this. I can't remember <laughs> exactly who it was, but like there's that. But I think just in terms of like the biggest ceiling, that's that's Adam Miller. Adam Miller was arguably, you know, you can debate him and Espino, but like Miller, the one thing that Espino is he always had limited innings, like going up through the system like he was a, like Miller was a was a horse and then it was just like constant finger injuries and you know it, he was the guy like he was going to be the guy he was the he was supposed to you know pair with CC like he's another guy if he had been healthy if you have Miller maybe Miller is even the better case for like if Adam Miller had been healthy in 2007 maybe it's a different different world of uh Cleveland baseball championships but Miller was supposed to be I'm the heir apparent. Your, I'm going to refute your Miller was a horse theory because he only had one year where he threw over 100 innings. So I don't really know if I could call him a horse. The guy never got over 100 innings besides one year. Which, he was he kept being he had, hurt. Yeah, he had one great year, and then that was it. Like, he never was healthy after that again. I mean, 2007, he threw 65 innings. 2008, he threw 20, 28 innings. He didn't pitch in 2009 or 2010. He pitched 44 innings in 2011, and then he pitched uh, 49 innings in 2012. And then... He had, uh, in 2004, he had over 100 innings. 2006, he had over 100 innings. 
He had 70 in 2005. Um, you know, he, Oh, you know what? I'm looking at fan graphs and they only go back yeah. to 06. So I'm guessing, I'm yeah. guessing they're missing a lot of years. Yes. That's why so it's... like, yeah. Oh, four, he had 134 innings. He had 70 in 2005. He had 158 in 2006. And that's kind of like where I expect, because 2006, he went from double A AA to triple A. And that's the year that he just, you know, kick butt as it were. And that's, that's when, you know, I'm thinking of him as a horse. Cause it's like, it, it was mostly double A and he just dominated it as a 21 year old in double A and was really good. And it's like, then 2007, he throws 65 innings and you know, it's, it's split amongst a lot. It, well, it's like triple A and then it's uh, health issues. And that's, you know, 2008, he doesn't, he only pitches in winter ball, doesn't pitch in 2000 or no, tw- 2008. I'm sorry. He pitches in uh, the, this data here is all messed up too. 2008. It's like a partial season, 28 innings. He looks good. You think, okay, maybe he's going to come back. Then he misses 2009 and 2010. And it's just like, he was supposed to be the guy and he had, I mean, 158 innings. Isn't that more than Espino was thrown in his minor league career? And Miller did it one year. So that's, that's why Miller yeah, close is, enough. is the guy. Um, yeah, but I mean, it's a, there's a different world where Miller and Aubrey don't get hurt. And this team wins the 2007 World Series. There, yeah, we'll talk about more guys who impacted that as well. Yeah, Miller was definitely on track by two, after 2004. He was definitely on track to be up in that rotation by 05 or 06, I would say. And he would have been there for 07 and would have made a big difference. And that rotation in 07 was good. I mean, but who knows? Like if Adam Miller's in that rotation in in 07, do you discover, do you get the one great year of Foster Carmona, Roberto Hernandez's year? Like he was up there only because of the Cleves injury. He was up there because of of Jake Westbrook's injuries. Like I'm sure they would have made room for Adam Miller because he was a top prospect, but yeah, that would have made a big difference. And then for Daniel Espino, it's hard to say like, he would he would have been up here by last year probably. I mean at least twenty twenty three, right? Like hard to say he wouldn't have been up in twenty twenty three and maybe even the end of twenty twenty two. The way he started off twenty twenty two. I'll, I'll say just... two thousand seven too. That's also the year we started the year with Jeremy Sowers in the rotation. So they they had a lot of turnover in that rotation early on. So what year was that? Two thousand seven. He start he did start the year in the rotation. Yeah, because he he started the year because he had the good two thousand six and then oh that's right yeah in wow. two thousand seven he was terrible. Paul Bird was your number three. Play. Westbrook was your four, and then you know everything else was a mess. So yeah, yeah, I think he would have had a chance. But I'm sorry for interrupting. He, I know that I, no, makes people irate. He would have, and then that one for me too is like I don't know. I mean, Espino the hard, the hard one for Espino is just like because he hasn't pitched in so long in two years now, we just forget like what a great talent Daniel Espino has been. And Adam Miller, Adam Miller in his own respect was every bit as good as Daniel Espino. I mean, he was one of the top pitching prospects in all of baseball as was Espino when he got hurt. And it's like, we just haven't seen him pitch in two years and you forget how high the upside was. And it's hard yeah. to like shoulder, shoulder injuries are not good. And, and the Adam Miller one, I think is an even bigger annoyance. What if, and I'm sure it's an annoyance to him himself, but, that was a, all finger related, like yeah. shoulders and elbows happens all the time to pitchers, unfortunately, especially elbows, blisters and blisters, it was a, it and was blisters. A, yeah. And then what was it like a nerve? He had a nerve issue in his finger. He ended after up getting that, like a hole the... in his finger from like some of the treatment. Like it was weird. Yeah. But yeah. It's it it really just that's... never, never ending blisters. Yeah. That's what makes it a bigger thing. It's just like, it was, he'd been in the era of sticky it? tack. He, it might not have been an issue at all. This is true. Yeah. If there was, well, who knows if they weren't using grip substances back then, but not necessarily sticky tack, but that's, that's the harder part to deal with. I feel like, is it was just a finger like the Spino. Yeah. Like shoulders are not good. And, but like there was, I I don't really remember all the talk around Adam Miller at the time, as far as like, I mean, he had, he had the prototypical build, right? Like he was, a yeah, big I mean, he was, he, was, he everyone... was, let's see, is this going to happen? He was baseball America. He was the 16th prospect in baseball, the 47th, the 23rd, and then the 29th pre-2008. And that's after he'd already had issues. I mean, he was a top 30 prospect yeah. three separate times. That's why you're right. A, a Miller over Espino in terms of, like, biggest prospect impact because Espino pitched, what, 19, 21, and then, and then part of, and just two starts in 2022, and that's it. We haven't seen much of him. We saw Miller for years. We were ready for him to take that leap and, and make it. And 
yeah, he would have been a big part of the rotation. And and I like his. I don't remember people talking about him as like yeah, an injury as, concern. Like Espino has 133 innings. Miller's biggest year yeah. was 153. Was more than one year, just, yeah. he threw he threw more innings than Espino yeah. ever has. So I guess I guess in comparison, that makes him a workhorse. <laughs> Um, I just don't remember anybody saying like, oh, there's injury concerns about Adam Miller. Like the way we, we've always talked about Espino is like a guy who like we're worried about health wise. And that's why a lot of teams had him off their board in 2018. Oh, Miller was and, safe. He was a big, thick, strong yeah, kid. That's what's even worse. Yeah. So, yeah, Adam Miller for sure takes the cake, I think, in this group of players. We've also got Jason Knapp on here, who was part of the Carlos Car- or the uh, Cliff Lee centerpiece deal. of the Cliff Lee trade. He he was the centerpiece. I I was really big on Jason Knapp. I saw him come to Lake County. He was not great initially, but he had some good starts for them. I just remember talking to him as a pitcher, and he was just like such a bulldog out there. Like that guy was like I thought he had the mentality you really needed from a top of the rotation guy. And I want to say with Cleveland's farm system, he threw like fifty or sixty innings, like, and that was it. And he came back after a long layoff after four years with Texas, the Rangers right? system. Yeah. And then and that was that he just never came back after that. And the Aubrey one, the Aubrey one's interesting because she said he would have been in the middle of the lineup in, by 07. They had Ryan Garko who, you know, turned out to be pretty good, but Michael Aubrey was a much better prospect, obviously. And we didn't agree on this one. I had Nick Weglars on here and I, I was a big Nick Weglars guy as he was coming up. The guy had power. He walked, he was definitely a DH. Um, but that guy to me had like, like I think he was Travis Hafner ish with his with his skill set. I don't think he was quite as good a hitter as Hafner, which we'll talk about him later. Mm-hmm. Um, Jason Knapp, by the way, Weglars. thirty-four total innings or twenty-four total innings in the Cleveland system. That was it. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, sixteen of them. He never threw more than sixteen innings in a season for them, which is just crazy. Right. And his was his was Tommy John. Then it was a shoulder and. Yeah, it was just uh, it eleven point two and twelve point one. That's it. Yeah, twenty four total innings. And then I think one people forget about a lot is Matt Whitney. I, I, if you're a, like a deep diver prospect guy, you know who he yeah. is. But like Matt Whitney was a legitimate middle of the order. Like like we're talking like you know when they traded for Andy Marte, everyone was like, oh, Andy Marte is the answer at third. Twenty five home runs, great bat. Matt Whitney was was that yeah. guy first. Pick like, up ba- was, a baseball basketball game, right? Where he shattered yeah. his leg. It broke his leg, yeah, and he just – it was never the same after that. They tried him at DH, they tried him at first base, and, yeah, the leg just never let him really recover. He was a comp first-round pick, right? Um, yeah, 33rd overall in 2002, and and, uh, and the power the power was real. I thought the hip tool was real. He his, walked. His he was first a season, defender when I saw yeah. him. The first season in the minors, he um, – you know, it, it was rookie league and A ball, so it's hard to judge. But two sixty nine, three forty seven, four nine seven, eight forty four misses all of 03. and I mean, he actually had a pretty good rebound in two thousand six, but after that, he never had another OPS over eight hundred. Like he was just a, a toolbox, and that was the fun thing with him. Like he stole five bases that year. He had twelve doubles. He had ten home runs. He was a guy that was ascending. Um, he was a hotly talked about prospect, and it's just one pickup game, and his career was never the same. In 2007, I thought he was back on the rebound, man. Like he threw, he played 120 games in 2007. He had 32 Great year. homers between best year yeah. of his career. That was the one of the first guys I ever saw mm-hmm. in, in doing prospects. And I was like, yeah, this guy for sure. You know, 32 home runs. He's walking, he's hitting, he played great defense. Everybody talked about him as a can't miss. Now he was 23 in all defenses. He was in low A and high A, but that's not why he failed. His, you know, we, he wasn't too good to be old for his level. It was just the leg just never let him be the same after all that. I mean, after that year, he never, he played a hundred games once. And then by 2009, he was just essentially just done. So yeah. Cause he broke about both. That and that's the thing too. It's like, it wasn't just one leg bone. He broke both leg the bones. Fib- the yeah, tib- the fibula and the tibia. Yeah. Yeah. He broke both, which is unusual. Um, He'd have been better off doing the Aaron Boone and just tearing his ACL, but yeah, just to really yeah, be careful. You're playing, you pick up basketball. If you see any guardians prospects out there playing basketball. And then he, uh, he had to have a second operation on that as well. It wasn't yeah clean, completely clean. So then they had to go back in and clean it up again after the transverse fracture. Like that's about as bad of a leg break as you can get. And it wasn't meshing yeah. together. And then they had to go back in and operate again. So. Yeah. Uh, all right, so those are the prospects. Those are a little less painful because, yeah. you know, Daniel Spino's still around. The other guys didn't make it. So you never, you, you know, the prospect people had hope. They never really hit the big leagues. We're going to twist the knife a little bit further. 
next segment, and we're going to talk about the guys who, if they'd have just been healthy at the right time, how different things could have been for this franchise. One thing you don't have to worry about in on FanDuel, hopefully, is injuries. Get ready to tackle the NFL season in action with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get 150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need in one place. Place live bets, all in one place in the NFL. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check the latest stats, view live play that play. So much more on the same page where you place all of your bets. The NFL trade deadline just happened. I know that. So a lot of impacts on on multiple teams. You know, I know the Lions just got a defender from the Browns. Um, some receivers changed hands in the last couple of weeks. There's been a lot of impactful trades. I, I'm I'm stunned actually that the NFL trade deadline has become a thing now. And when I was watching football more religiously, um, trades were just not that big of a deal. But they were in the NFL this year, and they have been. And those can make a big impact on on what you're betting. So you know, go out there and if you think uh, some of these trades could help your guys receivers catch more balls more yards more touchdowns more sacks uh get some over-unders going on whenever you get a hundred million game check that out visit fanlo.com to join today you'll get started with 150 in bonus bets if you win your first five dollar bet that's fanlo.com never waste a hunch and make every moment more with fanlo official sportsbook partner of the nfl Justin, can I interrupt you for one second? I, we just, I got to say one more thing on Matt Whitney, because I didn't realize this part of the story, and I'm curious if you did. So he got his surgery in Celebration, Florida. They almost never let surgeries happen outside of the Cleveland Clinic, and this might be why. So his surgery in Celebration, Florida, they put a rod in his leg. They inserted the wrong size rod in his leg. I so, did not know that. Good yes. Lord. I didn't know this at all. So that's why I had to interrupt you. The x-ray showed the bones weren't meshing together. And the reason for that, and this is from John Farrell, who was the farm director at the time, the diameter of the rod that was inserted in his leg wasn't thick enough to hold the two ends of the tibia. Farrell said the reason the wrong size rod was used in the first operation is the bone in Whitney's leg is thicker than the average person. So then he came he up to the clean. They, they had to come up to Cleveland Clinic and they had to take the bo- the rod they inserted it in between his legs. And I'm laughing because it's just painful to think about, but I didn't realize that that was part of the story that like that. And this might also be a case why, you know, they are very specific about where you get surgeries now. I mean, I'm sure Celebration Florida has a great hospital, but I I don't see them sending anyone to Celebration Florida for, you know, major surgical (laughs) events. No, I don't know where like, you know, Dr. Neil Ella Trashe is and all those guys that do Tommy John. I don't think they're yeah. in Ohio. They, so they send them to very specific people now. It's not like, hey, the yeah. random because Matt Whitney was from Florida. So it was probably like the hospital. Like <laughs> they're like, whatever, whatever you pick. Yeah, up, hey, whatever you feel comfortable with. with. It's like yeah, that's, now it's more like that we'll that we'll give you a list of approved guys to work with for sure. Uh, that's a funny thing you bring up, not really funny, because I remember, and this is gonna be one, one of the most impactful injuries for Cleveland. What if? The Michael Brantley one, the 2016 World Series stands out so heavily. I remember the story when Mike, I know my, the story when Michael Brantley hurt his shoulder in 2015, but I remember what happened was that the they gave him like the wrong diagnosis. Like, I think they were treating it as a a bicep issue or something else. There was something going on. I, I'd have to look at the exact Labrum? story. Labrum? Was it the, because I remember talking to him when he was in the, Mike, Michael Brantley gave me the worst interviews in the history of uh, AA Akron. That was uh, not a guy who, who liked he, he didn't he like nice to give interviews. And he, he if if, an if looks could kill, I wouldn't be around to do this show. Um, you know, it just wasn't his thing. And I also, and I don't hold it against him. Uh, it wasn't because, just you. It wasn't. Personal. No, it was, it was everyone. <laughs> and yeah. but it's also like it, it's also the thing. He was so frustrated because they couldn't figure out the fatigue and what was wrong. And like. You know, he it was he a misdiagnosis t- of where the yes. injury was. Yeah. And it's also that thing where like he got tired of being asked the same question by snot nose 20 somethings like every other day. Cause it was always like a lot of the uh, listen, Cleveland has a lot of great media coverage, but they used to have we used to have fantastic blogs on the Cleveland Cleveland baseball team. There used to be like five or six fantastic blogs, and they would send, you know, a two three guys a week to cover it so it was always new people but yeah michael brantley his frustration was just so palatable through all that yeah yeah and i mean i don't, I don't know how the like the coco chris thing turns out because coco chris i think was essentially here mostly because abraham almonte failed a ped test and he wasn't eligible for the postseason in 2016 yeah. um but I don't know, like if Brantley's healthy, do they even trade for Coco? Because they don't have to worry about Abraham Lamonte. I don't know. 
and Coco had some obviously big hits in that postseason we've talked about. Um, but the biggest thing for me is Michael Martinez was the last out of that 2016 World Series, and he was playing left field because they subbed out Coco because he had no arm. And in theory, that at bat could have gone to Michael Brantley, and I think you feel pretty good with a runner on second with Michael Brantley up there and with a tying run on uh, up there. So that that one hurts the most. I mean, they made the playoffs without him, and I'm sure that stung for him. And I'm you know they wanted him to be a part of that, and it just never never happened for him. And and you know he came back and he was better in 2017 and and 2018 he was good, but you know 2018 he also suffered some more some more or 2017 he suffered some more injuries too, which is unfortunate for him because you know go, looking at 2015 that guy had a fantastic year. Um, I think he would have a tw- didn't he have a 20 homers and 20 st- steals or something and he over 300. Um, was a just an okay defender. He had a great arm, but he wasn't the most rangy guy. But yeah, that 2015 season was special. And he just we 40, imagine, led the league in doubles with 45, 15 homers. Yeah. 60 like imagine that lineup hits. in 2016. You've got Santana and Kipnis and Lindor and Napoli. Um, you know, that top that four was so good. And then you had Jose, and then you could have you sprinkled in Michael Brantley there. That lineup's just so good. I think they would have done it and then the other guy too on that team is, is carlos carrasco and i i will contend to this day that if if carlos carrasco yes. pitches in 2016 the postseason we are talking mm-hmm. about the 2016 world champion cleveland indians because you don't have to throw like Corey. people forget this Corey kluber history has not been kind to Corey kluber in, in cleveland in some parts sadly everyone's like oh he was a playoff bus like i disagree with the playoff bus thing on Corey kluber because he went on three days rest in the Toronto ALCS, and then he went on three days rest twice in the World Series. He pitched game one, four, and seven. He pitched three games in the span of 10 days, and he was great in game four. Like, he pitched really well, and they won that game. Um, And then he came back, and he was just out of gas in game seven. And if you have Carlos Carrasco healthy, he makes one of those starts, and you're not. And maybe Carrasco gets beat. Maybe the Cubs beat him. I don't know. I guess we can say anything can happen, right? But I just feel like you would go, you would love to have gone to Kluber on on full rest in in, in game six or seven, um, and Carrasco takes the ball one of those games. And I know like Danny Salazar is mentioned in there, and like for me at least at least in terms of 2016, you can elaborate more on Danny Salazar's yeah. career. But in terms of 2016, I feel like I feel like pretty confident that the, the Indians would have won the World Series if Carrasco was healthy. Agreed. If it was if it was Salazar instead of Carrasco, I feel a little more dicey about that. Like I, don't, I, I, yeah. I could say like, yeah, there's no guarantee you would have pitched that well. I mean, Carrasco he was, was having a great year. he was an all star that year too. Like Salazar, that was his that was his peak career. It, that was that was he was really wasn't good it, that was year. Was it 15? No, it's 2016. Is when he, I mean, 2015 was a good year too. But 2016, the strikeout rate was over 10. He made the All Star game. I, you know, 15 was better on paper. If I'm being honest, looking at it now, but it's like he was still very good in 16. But yeah. I agree, Carrasco. And, one- and I got to throw a more qu- quick thing on the thing with Michael Brantley too. It's like if he had just been healthy, that might have affected multiple postseasons because maybe they give him the qualifying offer, and then maybe they get a draft pick. And the if they had an extra first rounder, I'm going to throw two names that I thought were very much oh, their no. type of guys that I even called at the time that they would have because they took a Spino who was very much their type of gamble but with a bonus first round pick. Michael Bush from UNC as kind of their college type of hitter tied who them a lot who would have helped them in this past postseason, And the other guy, uh, infielder Gunnar Henderson, I think is, is his name who went in the second round, who I, I mocked to them at various okay. points in the process. I heard here. He, he is somewhat okay. But so Michael Brantley, it's not just 2016, but it's like, if he had been healthy, then they definitely give him the qualifying offer. They're not afraid of him accepting it. You get that burn bonus first rounder. And then they might've had Bush or, H- or Henderson this year. And that, I mean, we talk about issues with this lineup that might've transformed this lineup in a lot of ways, having one more reliable All hitter. Star up there. Shortstop. Yeah. 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 Brantley. Cause he, if Brantley is healthy in 2017 and 2018, he's chugging along and yeah, yeah there's no, you know, the reason he didn't get the qualifying offer is because they thought he would accept it. And the, the risk was, was they weren't sure much. with the health. Yeah. Yeah. All right. A couple more names on this list. I know we got to talk about it, and Then we got to move on to some historical names and some guys that were on, you know, pretty great tracks that we haven't even gotten to yet. So a lot of, a lot of what ifs, if you are into just reliving some more pain of Cleveland baseball history coming up. 
But first, going to talk about our good friends over at Hims. It's a nice, easy name. You can remember that, right? H I M S. Hopefully, I don't have to spell that one for you. Hims is changing men's health care by providing you access to affordable sexual health treatments from the comfort of your couch. The process is 100% online, so there's no need for an uncomfortable doctor's visit. Just answer a series of questions on their site, and a medical provider will determine the right treatment option. If prescribed, your medication ships directly to you in discreet packaging for free. No insurance is needed, and there's one low price that covers everything from treatments to ongoing care. We all know it can be an uncomfortable thing to talk about, but if you need help, get help. You'll have a happier life. With hundreds and thousands, with hundreds of thousands of trusted subscribers, Hims can help you find the ED option that works for you. Start your free online visit today at hims.com slash locked on. That's H I M S. I guess I do have to spell it dot com slash locked on for your personalized ED treatment options. Hims.com slash locked on. The product mentioned are chewable compound products which are not approved or verified for safety or effectiveness by the FDA. Prescriptions require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if appropriate restrictions apply. See website for details and important safety information. Subscription required. Price varies based on product and subscription plan. And Arena Club. We want to thank Arena Club for coming back to us. For most for most of us that like collecting cards, the idea of spending two grand or more on a Luca Ellie or Mahomes rookie card just isn't in the cards. I love collecting. You can see some of my collection items behind me. Uh, but that's some serious money to drop. And frankly, I cannot afford that. That's But thanks to Slab Packs from Arena Club, now it's possible to score gem mints for a fraction of the retail, pr retail price. Every card that I listed was hit from last week's Arena Club Slab Pack drop. Arena Club is the only repack that provides real value and a complete view of all possible cards and a clear hit rates for each one. And that's their big thing, transparency. They want you to know what your odds are. They want you to know what's going to be available and what you could get. They are transparent and upfront. Right now, you can get 10% off your first slab pack or card purchase by going to arenacub.com slash locked on and use that code locked on MLB. That's arenacub.com slash locked on MLB, code locked on MLB for 10% off your first purchase. All right, quickly, some more names here on the most impactful group. Edwin Encarnacion, um, the 2017 one, you know, he rolls his ankle. He's out for the rest of the LCS or ALDS against the Yankees. And then Michael Brantley tries to come and play DH the last couple of games on an ankle that was clearly not good enough. And I think he was the last. No, he wasn't the last out, but I remember him hitting in one of the games, pinch hitting, and clearly he was just not healthy. But Edwin's ankle roll there, not great. Corey Kluber, you know, 2017, the back issue flares up. He gets two starts in that series, and he was just never – he was never right. And he was fine in 18. He wasn't great. Um, he was good. And then 2019, obviously, he gets the line drive off his, his arm, and that was pretty much the end of him in Cleveland, which is a sad, unceremonious end for him. Going back to the Danny Salazar thing real quick, too, I feel like we need to elaborate on this more. I think I think more people are aware of this now than they used to be, Jeff. But the Danny Salazar thing, like, everybody – it was a poorly kept secret among, like, anybody covering baseball, and I think most fans, to an extent – everybody knew he was on borrowed time. Like that yeah. arm was just not going to hold up. Like, and there were reports of a guy who just was not like fully committed the work between stuff. Yeah. yeah. The work between starts wasn't there. The, you know, just did not, not a lot of arm care routines were poor. It was just a lot of just riding on that fastball in a lot of ways. He reminded me and Jared of Jarrett Wright, who, you know, had a good couple of years and his arm blew out too. And Cleveland sure could have used him in 99 and 2000 and 2001, but his arm was just, gone by then too and then we debated these last two nick swisher and michael Bourne. um i'll contend that nick swisher's knee injuries were part of his downfall to his career in cleveland i thought that skill set would age well he walked a lot had a guy at the plate he had some power um i thought he'd age fine i was always a little worried about michael Bourne just because speed is the first thing to go on guys and his a lot of his value was tied to his speed on defense and running the bases and I was always worried that would fall apart for him, and it and it did very quickly. So, but they sure could have used those two guys, those contracts. If those contracts work out, you know, who knows what happens in fourteen and fifteen, right? Because they're not trading them, right? And those contracts could have gone into twenty sixteen. And you're talking about maybe Michael Bourne in twenty sixteen as your center fielder, and um, maybe you're not struggling in center field, and maybe Nick Swisher has is some kind of impact. I don't know. Yeah, no. Those are interesting. Um, 
you know, I, I think the other thing to say with Salazar too, it's like with the way his arm was like, it, even if he had not been a starter, he could have been something, an extra arm in that pen help extend. Cause I mean, the, the pen was, was on its last legs by game seven. It's like having the real option to go to him could have been huge. Yeah. All right. Let's turn our attention to some historical ones. We probably aren't going to give us as much time as we should. Yeah. Truthfully, just because of, of length, but, uh, Can I, Eddie Joss. Yeah. Yes. Well, here, before we do Eddie Joss, let's go the other way. Let me knock out some of the quick ones. Um, super quick here. Okay. Uh, super Joe Charbonneau. So he won the rookie of the year. And then two, you had two more like partial seasons and was out of baseball. Uh, his, his, if you're like, oh, maybe he's lucky. His bat pip wasn't bad in 1980. Uh, he was an older player, debuted at age 25. But then he hurt his back the next year in spring training, tried to play through the whole year, got surgery after it was done. And you know, early 80s back injuries could be a bear. And who's to say, you know, he was a guy who had 42 extra base hits that year for a team that didn't have a lot of things going well for him. He was an exciting, fun guy. And it's just that's really unfortunate. Uh, and then my well, one my dad always brought up was Ray Fossey. 1970, Pete Rose runs him over at uh the all-star game. And he was fantastic that year. You know, he had a 124 OPS plus he had 307, 361 on base, 469, 830 OPS. Again, BAPIP doesn't show him to be lucky. He won the gold glove. He'd win the gold glove the next year. And that was essentially, uh, I think, I think he qualified as a rookie in 19. I mean, he must not have qualified as a rookie. He had been up enough in, in six, the previous three years, because it doesn't have him getting rookie of the year votes in 70, but he essentially was, uh, a rookie doing all of that. And then the next year, you know, he's just not, doesn't never approaches those numbers again. It's never quite, quite the same guy. And if I didn't mention Ray Fossey in terms of injuries, like I said, my father would be <laughs> like, I, I could just hear him already. Like that was the guy, him and Herb score who uh, I'll leave to you to talk about, but you, you got to mention Fossey. You got to mention super Joe. Yeah. The Herb score one. It's just, I mean, you did the research on the Herb score one. That yeah, guy yeah. had just the worst <laughs> luck his entire life. So when he was three years old, a truck ran over his legs and crushed both of them. Uh, then when he was getting better from that, he got rheumatic fever uh, a few years later. In high school, he broke his ankle playing basketball. And while that was healing, he had to have an emergency appendectomy. Uh, by the way, in 1957, the Boston Red Sox offered to buy Herb score for $1 million. In today's money, that would be $11 million, just to straight out. He was viewed as the heir apparent. Um you know, I, I will say just uh, he was supposed to be the lefty Bob Feller. I will say Bob Feller had a knee injury that we didn't quite squeeze in here that you can go and look at the data. It's just kind of an interesting one. I'll say do some research on your own. But for Herb Score, he looked like a Hall of Famer. And then, you know, obviously, I mean, the baseball to the face. Like, there, there's no other way around it. That line drive is one of the sick and most sickening things you can see on a baseball field. And even though it's a grainy, I feel like I've seen the video. Like, doesn't that exist? Haven't we? It was the maybe it's somewhere it's I feel like that, like, if not, I've internalized what happened so much that 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 video lives inside of me, even if it doesn't exist. But it's he was the real deal. He was strikeout rates that were unbelievable for the era he played in. Uh, he was he was he was a game changer. He was just the best. I will say he was the best pitcher in baseball during that time. No one could quite match what he was able to do from the left side. There's a reason why a team was going to pay him you know, obscene amounts of money. He won the rookie of the year. He led the league in strikeouts as a 22 year old and as a 23 year old. And no one could yeah, hit him. He was, he had the lowest hit incredible. rate in baseball. He was absolutely incredible. Yeah. And then Addie Joss is one that people bring up all the time. Died at the age of 31 of what yeah. was it? Um, I've got it. Uh, let's see. So he died. Uh, sorry. I got it right Not here. Pneumonia. It was meningitis. Yeah. It was, it was meningitis due to, to, to yeah. tuberculosis meningitis, which might be, I'm not sure what the T yeah. it was T, but obviously, yeah. yeah, obviously he was on a hall of fame track too. And, and I mean, and he, he is he, in the hall of fame, but he is, he is in the hall of fame, but just, it was only a, a nine year 1978. Career. He just, yeah, he pitched till he was, pitched till he was 30. And, yeah. but he, yeah, he was a veterans. Know. He was inducted in 1978 through the veterans committee because yeah. he didn't have quite enough numbers. No, but his numbers were just incredibly historical and, yeah, he uh, collapsed on the field happened so fast. Yeah, it uh, happened so and, fast. Then they and had then the, it was the end of it. The, yeah, they had the benefit game for him. At um, I was looking up some of the history of League Park and they had the benefit game for him not long after he won a Cy Young and or you know or what not the Cy Young but the you know 
it's all the stuff he did historically. It's just it's just insane to think about yeah. with him. And, and I gotta say again, something we don't have on here. Smokey Joe Wood was a really good outfielder. Go look him up because he's a uh, with Boston was a pitcher who was a Herb score like who then came to Cleveland and was an important part of those teams as an outfielder. Yeah. Uh, you know. Did the, you the, the did you mention over. Ray Chapman? I did not. So Ray Chapman, I think, gets short shrift. Like we all know, he dies on the field, but it's like his numbers were, you know, in 1920. He was a 303 hitter, 380 on base, a 109 OPS plus. Like this is a dude for his entire career. He had, you know, he's yeah, a good he hitter, was, a shortstop. Yeah, yeah. He he was and by accounts was a, a solid defender. I mean, it's it is when it is, so it's hard to say. But it's like 131 OPS plus, 115, 111, 109. He was, you know, tw- had he even turned? He hadn't even turned 30 yet when he when he died. Like that's you just you have to mention him. Um, I got, I mean, talk about snake bite, like this franchise, when you're talking about Addie Joss and Ray Chapman, and Steve Owens and the yeah. Tim Cruz, it's just, it's amazing in a terrible oh, way. Oh, we didn't even get into that. Jeez. I, yeah. I honestly, we were talking about off the air, like who else to add to this, this discussion. And I didn't even think of, of Steve Owen and, and Tim Cruz and, and, you know, what a big part of that bullpen they were back in the 90, early nineties before. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, happened uh, there. you know, I don't know if an extra bullpen been around and, helps them. They would they would have been around in 95. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Steve Owen was their closer. So he would have been in 95 and yeah, Mesa and Owen. Yeah. It's just, I honestly, that one slipped my mind. And then we should have given more time to these guys, but we're just running out of time in this episode. Yeah. But obviously I, to me, at least from a personal standpoint, Grady Sizemore is the biggest what if in history yes. because um, should have, I mean, was on a hall of fame track and played a hundred percent people. I, I really, as a baseball fan and as, as a guardians fan, Indians fan growing up, whatever, it really bugs me to my core for anybody to talk about, oh, Sizemore was always injury prone. And that, that's he all you remember. He was no, not. he played three straight years. He played 100, what was it, 162, 162, and like 158. For three straight years, that guy was posting almost every day. And the, the fourth class, year was 157. Yeah, and 157. So that guy never played less than 157 games. Four straight years, gold gloves, silver yeah. sluggers, all star games. His uh, 20 his, to 30 home runs, 20 or 30 steals, gold glove defense. I mean, he was base, Mike Trout before Mike Trout. Oh yeah. his, his baseball reference page, age 22, most similar player, Duke Snyder. Duke Snyder ended up with nearly seven, uh, over 65 war in the Hall of Fame. Age 23, Duke Snyder, Hall of Fame. Age 24, Mookie Betts. Age 25, Barry Bonds. Age 26, Barry Bonds. And then it's Reggie Smith and Michael Kadire because of the, you know, the, the health and yeah, where it went. Is. It's just like, yeah. This dude, he was he was one he was baseball's Iron Man from 2006 to to or you know for those four years. He I remember people discussing 2005 2008. He was baseball's Iron Man during that time, and then it just yeah he played 110 percent, and it just it, it unfortunately didn't agree with him. I will say this: Grady Sizemore, not not a well spoken guy. I got one chance to interview him in my career when he was rehabbing in Akron. It was such a highlight, and again, not much to say. But I remember he was down there doing media or not media, but he was rehabbing and he did media the first night. I didn't cover the first night. I was there for the second night. And typically the guys will talk the first night. They won't talk the second night because they don't want to get asked the same question over and over. And they want to focus on getting their rehab in and getting out of there. Right. Second night, I was like, you know, I wasn't here. Can I talk to him? And they're like, yeah, we'll see. And he agreed to talk. And he's got his laptop as he's walking out of the clubhouse because he's on getting ready to do a fancy football draft. Um, and you know, he's sitting on his laptop doing that and, and still talking to me. And he had no reason to, to interview me. I was, I was a 20 something year old college kid. And again, the agreement was he would talk the first night and not necessarily the second night, but he still agreed to, he was doing his fancy football draft and he still was like, just talking about coming back from, from injuries. And it was just a treat as someone who grew up watching him and, and for them to, to have that kind of humility and respect when he didn't definitely didn't have to. Is that a Grady Sizemore sign? Yeah, it's my Grady Sizemore sign baseball. That is the Holy Grail. Yeah, Holy yeah, Grail. Right um, other guys that fit here: Sandy Alomar, obviously one of an icon in franchise history because he's just been here so long. But uh, people forget Sandy how Alomar, much he like, missed. Yeah, and he was look his he was the rookie of the year. He in the All Star team. He was a Gold Glove winner in ninety one or ninety. He made a couple other All Star teams, but outside of ninety seven, like never really played that much. And it's just unfortunate because his knees didn't agree with him being a six foot five catcher. Travis Hafner obviously stands out here because after 07, he had, I mean, he, he was still a good per- performer on the field. He just couldn't stand the field that all oh, that shoulder and elbow just were done for him. We had some people bring up Shane Bieber 2024. Obviously he would have been a huge boon to the rotation in this past postseason. 
And and honestly, Shane Bieber was on a heck of a trajectory with this team from All Star Team 2020. I know I know 2020 is 2020, and he won the Cy Young. It was All Star Team in 2019. 2022 he had a great year. All 20, 21, 23, and 24 just wiped out what he was going for. Um, Jose Ramirez, 2019. We talked about Corey Kluber wasn't healthy in 2019. Jose Ramirez missed the last couple of weeks with that handmade injury. Remember, he came off the injured list and hit a grand slam mm-hmm. and threw a home run the same, in the same game, and he was done after that because he just could not withstand the pain of swinging. But no rehab games, nothing. And they won 93 games that year, don't forget. And that was mostly without Jose Ramirez the last two months and without Corey Kluber the whole year. And he started I slow, think. too. Like, Jose Ramirez struggled. Because he, yeah. he was still jump, jumping out of that 2018 funk. That yeah. 2019 team should have won the division if it yep. wasn't for those two. And then the last one, just real quickly before we get out of here, Travis Fryman um, just was never really healthy with Cleveland. Had like a good year or two, but he was just pretty much at the end. Like he was, we were talking about this last week, Jeff. He was out mm-hmm. of baseball a lot earlier than I think any of us realized. But a guy who was a good, you know, he won a gold glove, was a solid hitter. Just never thought he would, he was out of the league that fast. I thought he played a lot longer, but solid player. Just never, never stuck around. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, maybe not so much. If people didn't enjoy the, the, the sad historical trip, but uh, it was fun to talk about some guys. Remember some guys and think about what if Thursday trade talk Thursday, give us some trade candidate ideas from the guardians, from other teams. We'll discuss trades on Thursday, as we always do on trade talk Thursday on lockdown guardians. Thank you for joining us. Remember to rate and review download and make sure you watch, maybe watch twice, help us out. Thank you all. And go, go guardians. Go.